Hey there, everybody. You're joining myself, Cassandra, and Kelly is two parts of the Water Trio. Um, and we're here tonight with uh, Leetson, who is going to be speaking at the Queer Astrology Conference this weekend. So we thought we'd invite uh, you on and talk about your uh, talk for the conference and tell us a little bit about yourself um, for your listeners. So this is the first conference that you've spoken at. Is that correct? Yeah, this will be my first conference ever. I'm very excited. So awesome. You excited? Yes, very much. A little bit nervous, Excellent. but mostly very excited to get to be in conversation with people about what I'm working on and to hear from Excellent. other folks. And tell us about that. What I, what's your topic about? So I'm doing a, I've been, I actually, I should say that I stumbled upon a piece of research that I'm calling the astrology of abolition. And I really stumbled into it because I felt really lost after George Floyd was murdered. And I was just trying to make sense of everything for myself. And, you know, maybe both of you can relate to this, but every time I feel lost, the first thing I do is I go to the planets. Yes. I ask the planets, what's going on? How do I make sense of this time? And as I was just really working with different charts, I realized that I was finding something about the history of the abolition movement from the 1800s and finding what looks to me like a correspondence to this current moment that we're in. Because it's the first time in the US history that there's a national conversation about abolition again. Mm, yeah. Since the 1800s, and I was like, what's going on? And so I started looking at different charts of history um, and doing a lot of research about when social movements ripen and really peak. Mm. But also, when does a conversation that's happening in the streets and in social movements get picked up by the political process and begin mm. to be debated by governments themselves? Wow. And so I was really curious about that. So that's really yeah. that's the summary of the talk. That sounds so interesting. So the shift from when that collective movement at like the grassroots level almost escalates into the political process, which is, of course, where change can be affected, you know, that has an impact rather than just part of a conversation. Yeah, it's, it's certainly where laws are made, right? And I think yeah. the work of social movements is to push the conversation to that point. Yeah, that's so interesting. And so, yeah, because your talk is titled Astrology of, Ob of Abolition, Pluto as Destruction and Reconstruction. And so it's based on this research that you found from the 1800s to do with the abolition movement. Yes. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's a historical mundane astrology. And, you know, probably other people can relate to this, but I have, pr I have primarily been a consulting astrologer. But given just the shape of 2020, it's turned me into someone who's doing mundane astrology because we have to make sense of this moment. Yeah, um, sure. So the research is really about, it's actually about the history of slavery and then abolishing chattel slavery in the U.S. And what I really look at is I propose a new birth chart for the U.S. And I know us astrologers use a lot of different U.S. birth charts. Yes. Um, I think most of them revolve around the time of the Declaration of Independence for the U.S. Yes. But I want to propose one that's 150 years before that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. early 1600s? Yes, 1619, because that was the moment that slavery began in the U.S. Colon in the US colonies. Oh, wow. wow. So you're really going right back to the origins of the slave trade, which I think some people think has gone on forever, but actually does have a starting point, I think, in the, in the 1500s. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. So interesting. So, and you, you're right. I mean, so much of what we're all grappling with, I would have described myself the same. I primarily, primarily have spent my career talking to individuals about, their, about astrology from a personal experience. But I have found myself, you know, looking at the last hundred years or the last thousand years, you know, to try and make better sense of why these planetary cycles in 2020 are igniting so much that they are. Yeah. 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 And so one of the things that I got really curious about um, is planetary returns. And this actually came out of listening to a couple of episodes on Chris Brennan's astrology podcast. Yeah. You know, I think he's talked about the Uranus return mm -hmm. in Gemini. And I'm kind of giving away a little bit of the punchline here, but there'll be more at the talk itself. But what I realized is that 
if we look at the 1619 year as one of the births of the U.S. nation, mm-hmm. you know, because a thing like a nation has so many formations, and we know as astrologers yes. that you can, there can be multiple births or beginnings, right? Yes. So if we look at 1619 as one beginning, as the beginning of the institution of slavery, what I discovered is that upon the Pluto return of that chart, so 240 something years later, is actually when slavery got abolished. Wow. Oh, that is fascinating. So, because a lot of people are talking about 2020 as the US, as the Declaration of Independence, Pluto return, but you're looking specifically at slavery in the US, and that has a different starting point to the Declaration of Independence, and then you're moving forward from there. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting how these cycles are aligning up. You know, America's not trying to be free from anything at the moment in terms of, um, you know, not breaking free from England, like, you know, independence was kind of born from. So, you know, ha- it's what we've got this connection between the slavery starting and now kind of, you know, abolishing it from a standpoint of uh, social equality and yeah. equality in what's available and kind of trying to get Pluto you know, to transform, to use that kind of very common Pluto word, the the social side of, um, you know, the aftermath of what was started. So, yeah, I'm loving how, you know, you've been able to gel those two things together. So it's not so much about America's independence on the Pluto return. We've actually got to dig a little bit deeper and go, well, the themes that are coming out, you know, in 2020 are actually not really it's the kind of maybe the legacy of colonialism, but it's finding its uh, spark or it's finding its beginning or it's finding the roots actually further back in, in, in the 16, 19 years you've, as you pointed out. So yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Sandra. That's, that's yeah. Really amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes really we can kind of that. almost like, sometimes we can almost just kind of um, not like short, um, like, like see Pluto as, you know, not so powerful, but I mean, more like, because Pluto can spend so long in a sign, it can have so much of a long-term influence. So sometimes as astrologers, we can kind of try and look for something more or something more pinpointed. But, you know, when we're, I guess, looking at really long cycles of history, we're talking like hundreds of years, you know, Pluto can tell us a lot over a long period of time. So, Oh, wow. I know. I'm, I'm feeling very excited for your talk now to hear about all of this. Yeah. I you feel like. You... Our... So you go. Well, I just feel like you picked up the heart of what I'm excited about so quickly, Cassandra. I'm like, oh, thank that's you. very exciting to me also, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and as someone who has also been really primarily focused on the traditional techniques in the past mm. some years, I do, I don't, you know, I don't look at Pluto that much. It's not no, part of our training in yeah, traditional you've astrology. Art, yeah, you've articulated <laughs> what I'm trying to say a whole lot better than I do, like, I'm Pluto Shmudo, but it's like, yeah, it's true. Sometimes we can overlook the obvious because we're trying to, like, dig just that little bit deeper. And if you think about the astrology times that you're analysing right now, Pluto wasn't even part of the you know, the astrological zeitgeist of that time, you know, we didn't know it existed. So it's, it's really interesting how you've really connected these dots. So, wow, very exciting. And I just love how it's really, you know, what you've kind of highlighted in 1619 is really kind of the genesis of what we're actually dealing right with right now. So fascinating. I can't wait to hear it all. Cool. It does sound very exciting. So that makes me wonder, Litzen, around some of your other interests with growing plants. I'm like, this is this is a little bit of a detour from your what you often spend your time doing, I guess, as a practitioner. Yes, yeah. So I do identify as a food grower. Um, well, you know, I have a Taurus North Node, so I I try to act, actively reach for that potential. You know, of really being content with the earth that we have now, you know, like being content with what's available, the abundance that's naturally available. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I I often think of it as I'm really interested in all of the planets, including the one that we're standing on. Mm. I'm interested in the ones in the sky, but also the one that's home. 
And I want to learn this one well as well. And are there any types of plants that you prefer growing? Are you growing plants according to like lunar cycles or planetary cycles? How are you kind of integrating the two? Yeah. So I have tried that sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll really try to seed things on the new moon or right after a new moon. I'm not always able to just because, you know, life and time. Yes. But what I really love about planting is that it actually does teach me a lot about astrology. Um, you know, Kelly, I first learned about doing secondary progressions from you, taking your class on it. Yeah. And there's so much that we talk about with secondary lunar progressions, like the secondary lunar phases, that we make these analogies to plant life. Yes. So growing plants has actually been very useful for my astrology practice and more like better understanding what it's like when something's beginning and it might be in, you know, the new moon phase or the yes. crescent phase where it's just struggling to get out of the dirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. And like, I, I see it happen, right? It's like, it's, that's all it needs to do is just try to pop out of the earth. Yeah. So that's how I sometimes will counsel people I work with who are in a progressed crescent phase, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a beautiful analogy, isn't it? And I love that what you mentioned about like the planets in the sky, but the planet that's home and how some of those very earthly experiences, like watching the cycle of a plant. Like I think if you've never grown something from seed before, it's such a great experience to watch even just an annual plant that's going to have like less than 12 months, watch it germinate and see nothing happen for a while and really understand what goes on in the new moon phase, if you like, because it's all that underground internal. And I love how you describe that struggle when the plant, you know, it's just trying to get its little head and its two leaves above the dirt. And, and then once it goes through its blooming or its fruiting cycle and how it just kind of goes fallow for a period of time or, or dies off, like it's had its process, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I love that plants are like astrology in that way that has this whole cycle, mm. but it's not like, I love that in astrology. We don't draw time with a line. Yes. We draw time with a wheel. It's a mm -hmm. circle. Yes. It's like we literally cycle through. And I think plant life teaches us a very similar lesson. Beautiful. For sure. Beautiful. And so you are offering consults to people um, with astrology. That's part of your work or your offering in the world. Yeah, it's definitely what I do with most of my work time. Um, and I've really, I've really been in love with doing relationship counseling as an astrologer. I really love seeing people together, and not just couples, but when I get the chance to work with people who are, let's say, family, it feels really special. Um, and I don't know if you know this about me, but before I was an astrologer, I used to work in social justice. I was a youth organizer. And then as someone who worked in nonprofits, I often saw that our nonprofit work environments did not uphold all the values of justice that we would talk about. Mm. So I became someone who like organized at my own job as a nonprofit worker, um, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my employers. And, mm. and that I think taught me something very deeply that the world is made up of relationships mm. and the world is changed by our relationships. So I really love to use my astrology to help us be in wise relationship, to use it beyond self-serving purposes. And that's actually how it's brought me to return to social justice as part of my astrology practice. I'm like, how do we use this beautiful language and beautiful tool to change our relationships to each other so that we can change the world also? Beautiful. So focusing on the relational components, which is really everything, isn't it? The way we interact and how that enhances collaboration, connection, support, and understanding, or we can interact in a way that creates division and disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as we're talking about, it's also our relationship to the earth, which we know we really need to work on as a human species right now. Yeah. And I, you know, some of that is also available in the chart. How can we learn to relate to the earth differently. Mm, beautiful. And this is such a Taurus North Node sort of piece <laughs> that you're expressing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a very, I'm a very air chart. I'm a moon in Libra, a sun in Aquarius, and my rising is Capricorn. So I, you know, I try to reach for the earth also. Love it. Yeah. As a way of like anchoring all that air. Yeah. 
That's beautiful. Definitely. And so with your organizing, is that something that is coming out through your astrology at the moment? Are there other ways that you're expressing that at this time? Yeah, well, so, you know, doing all of this research, which again, it was just, I was doing it just to find my way through it, this difficult moment of 2020. Um, but doing all this has really helped me bridge these parts of my life. Beautiful. And I'm not actively involved in some social movements in the U.S. right now because I'm, I'm weathering the pandemic from Taiwan. But it's really inspired me to bring this relational part of my practice into the larger collective relationship. And so I'm working on a series of, that's astrology for social movements. Mm. Both for us to understand as astrology people, the astrology behind social movements, which is actually really clear. In the okay. it's, it's, yeah. so, it's super clear. Yeah. Um, but also to share this astrology language with social movements and with organizers, because I think having that tool could be extremely useful for our social movements right now. Yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense, doesn't it? A huge part of our work as astrologers on whatever level we're offering it out in the world is to help people sort of align their their efforts with these moments of opportunity or possibility. And if there are astrological cycles that you're really seeing correlate with social movements, then why not have the social movement communities know about that so they can hope to be more effective and actually create, like, as you said, push that conversation to the point that it can affect changes at the legal, political, like with law, which is where we can start to have the wider shift really come in. To me, that's almost like a no-brainer, but then I'd never thought of it like that before. So I think there's a really powerful offering to bring forward. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in the development phase right now of astrology for social movements. Yeah. But you know what you're saying, it's like, I, I saw that you just also recently put out a piece about Mars and Aries, and I feel like this is such a useful piece to share with social movements right now, right? That Mars yeah. and Aries going retrograde will be overcome by Saturn and Capricorn. Yeah. Saturn is a stronger yeah. planet. So like yeah. that will help us think about this is a moment for strategy, not just like being reactive. Yes. Yes, it is. It's, and some of that work, I mean, it's, it's based on my own understanding of the planets, but I heard Nina Griffin speak on this and she used the word, the idea of a siege. And I thought that was really interesting that you want, you've got to be really strategic in something like a siege. You're not going to get quick wins. And it's that weird, particularly in social movements right now, because we're seeing this explode, you know, in Australia as well, where we're from and, and even in Canada, it's that sense of wanting to capitalize on momentum and the fact that these conversations are happening in a wider environment, but also needing to think about how can we channel this into something that is going to have a longer term impact rather than just get the quick quick win now um, totally yeah oh wow so this i feel like we could talk all day listen <laughs> <laughs> so your talk is astrology of abolition pluto as destruction and reconstruction and you're going to be presenting your research based on this proposed new chart for the us i i'm like Cass. i'm like i can't wait to hear this talk um, and that's at the Queer Astrology Conference this weekend. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Cass, do you have other questions for Lee Sen? Lee Sen, is there anything else you want to share with everyone today? How are you we going? touched on the plants, but did you really tell us like what you're growing? Like in terms of... Oh, yeah, is... that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell us that. Come on, my Taurus planets need to know. <laughs> that's so great. I love that question. Well, I'll tell you one of the plants I'm really excited about right now. It's super easy to grow. Um, but do you know chayote? No. no. I don't know what it's called in English. That's the, that's the Spanish, Spanish name. That's what my Mexicans' friends call it, chayote. Yeah. And in Mandarin, we call it Buddha's hand because it's a, it's a little um, squash that kind of looks like a hand. Okay. okay. Oh, is it yellow? It's light green. Light green. Okay. And it's really the size of like a fist. In the, yeah. In the, like the wrist and the fist. Okay. Okay. And... So I love this plant because it turns out the leaves are also edible. And, you oh, know, wow. Chinese people love to have all kinds of fancy names for things. So the squash is called Buddha's hand, but the leaves are called dragon's whiskers. Okay. Buddha's <laughs> hand and dragon whiskers. This sounds like a very powerful plant. <laughs> yeah. I think it's called dragon whiskers because it, it shoots out those curly cues. Okay. Oh, 
Oh yes. The wrap around yep. the yep. trellis. Yeah. 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 Like, like a sweet pea or something like that. Yeah. that. yeah, exactly. Okay. So I just love any kind of plant that I can eat the whole thing of and, and being in Taiwan right now, um, it's a, it's a land that grows a lot of bamboo by naturally. It's a weed actually. So sometimes bamboo is like a weed. Do, <laughs> so that's my ignorance of not being from Asia. That's, such a I didn't know that until <laughs> recently either. Yeah, it's not just wow. you. Wow, okay, okay. Well, to yeah. your land, it would be, you know, like it's like kangaroos are a menace to us. We have too many of them, you know what I mean? So, but everyone's like, That's oh, true. how could you do that to the kangaroos? But yeah, it's the co- controlling it, I guess, the population. So for you, bamboo is, so you're in the right climate. It just grows everywhere to a point of excess. Yes. So yeah. what's really awesome about it is that when I need to go build a trellis I just tromp into the woods a little bit and like hack down an old bamboo that isn't doing much any else anymore like hack down old bamboo and like you know tromp back to the garden and cut it up and make a trellis so that's been something I'm it's so small but I'm pretty new to gardening in this way so it's very exciting for me (laughs) yeah there's something very satisfying, isn't there, about like using the resources that are there and then getting your hands onto something um, and repurposing. And yeah. It, yeah, you can almost feel how much this is engaging you and stimulating you. Yeah, it's very tangible, which we don't get to do a lot of in our modern world. <laughs> No. And one thing, tell me if you find this as well. Once you've spent some time in the garden, it's like you come back and your mind is all refreshed and there's ideas or things that have been percolating. It's like, oh, I know how to grapple with this idea or this topic now. That's exactly how I feel. It's, it's really good for my creative process. I think it must be a type of creative rest that allows me to regenerate new ideas. Yeah. So you also experience that? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard. Um, when I don't have time in the garden because I eat, I've, you know, when I've traveled and things like that and I don't get, you know, a little bit of time in the garden and you're not even doing anything. You might be pulling some weeds or chopping a flower. Like it's not always productive time, but there is a, I think creative rest is a great way of describing it. Similar to the way I think, you know, writers would say they get in the shower and then they have a great idea. It's like you turn off the conscious producing part of your mind and all the stuff that's been deeper and marinating is free to, to be attended to or explored. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kelly and Cassandra, I imagine that listeners might want to know what you're excited about growing if you are growing anything that you're excited about. Well, Cass has got some beautiful flowers. Yes, you've sat and drunk tea in my garden before. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so you're um, growing a flower I've never been able to grow, Cass, so you must tell people about it. What, my lilies? Yes. Oh, really? That's what I was going to talk about. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I remember not long after I had my son and, you know, I was in just a place and space in my life. I was ready. I wanted to make change, but I wasn't ready. And I had this wonderful person here in Brisbane and he was a really wonderful guide and mentor and he called it my spring manifestation project. So this was like in maybe July or August. And so, you know, went to Bunnings, you know, we're like Home Depot if you're in the U S and, um, you know, got my, all the gear and, uh, planted some lily bulbs and I don't know, I just wanted pink at the time. And I was like, these could be ready by like the Libra new moon. And of course they were. And oh, every wow. year they just bloom, bloom, bloom. And I love that we're talking about it. Cause I've been meaning to go back cause I want to, Um, that's a special thing like that, you know, those, and they just multiply every year. I get another strand of them and they're big and I cut them and I give them to people. And now that I have cats, I'll have to stay outside. But, um, but yeah, I want to just transform like that section and have all white lilies moving forward. So I, I love to grow. I don't know. Like I would like to be the Taurus that has, like food, <laughs> but I think I'm like the Libra stuff comes. I just want things to look really nice. So I love all the flowers and like white flowers, whether they're gardenia, it's like got a feature plant, it's a gardenia. They have to smell beautiful. And I love jasmine and I'll, yeah, I just, I'm a sucker for flowers. So, and food, but I just don't grow it. So that's what I'm growing at the moment. So I always kind of like, we had some rain before, real heavy downpour. And of course I pushed them all out into the, move the pots out into the, the rain. So 
because some of them are a little bit undercover. They get a lot of sun, but undercover. But yeah, I'm getting a bit excited talking about my garden. So what are you growing, Kel? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> you mentioned gardenias, which is one of my favorite flowers. Mm. Um, not something we can grow outside in Canada, but you do sometimes see it in pots. You know, through in the, Sydney, they grow so they well, just, don't they, they? Yeah, the, the climate mm, in Sydney rip, is perfect. Right for them. Yeah. yeah. And that, so they're fine out. And the smell, I mean, this is something Cass mm. and I do share a love of is, you know, plants with beautiful smelling flowers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful i mean so right now i'm in an apartment and we we're in europe for my husband's job and so i've just got a balcony garden and uh i really did notice the absence of a garden so it was one of the first things i did when i got here was just like uh, we'd go to even just the grocery store and i'm like oh that's a plant we can get that you know and so the two that i'm really enjoying i've got two i've got two roses one's a one a really vibrant deep pink and the other is this mm. beautiful peachy color and i've got one on each we've got two little balconies we've got one on each and then it's the fragrance that just like you mm. Cass, is the fragrance that really um attracts me um because yeah. it is a bit hard to get roses that have fragrance now and there's a if lady you don't on the get corner. them from your garden yes yeah there's a lady on the corner um she has a beautiful rose garden and my son has no earth in his chart. So every time, ever since he was in nappies, I would like make him stop and smell these roses as on our way to and from the park. And sometimes in the rush to come back home and, you know, get the dinner bath and all of that routine happening, he's like, mom, you forgot to smell the roses. And I'm like, my work is done. So you know, we smell them <laughs> together and it's, it's really nice. So yeah, but no, like smelling those garden roses, you like you buy them from the shop and they just never have a fragrance. So it's just so beautiful. Do you, as you as we were talking and Liz and you were so kind to share about your chart with the air planets and some earth. And I'm wondering if smell is like an intersection between the element of air and the element of earth. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's not a tangible thing. So to me, it's got that air connection. But it's coming, you know, we've been talking about it coming from a beautiful flower, which is a plant. So it has that earth. It's it's sort of this little crossover place, maybe. Mm. I mean, it could just be going off. It's kind of like a part of the earth that you can't touch it. Touch. You can't touch the yeah. smell, but the smell comes from it. Yeah. You know, whether it's the rain hitting the grass or fresh cut grass or, you know, mm. you don't see, you, you don't see the smell. So it's a very interesting point there, Kel. This is totally left field because I'm not sure about that. But what I do feel as an air and earth crossover person is um, things like charades. That's my crossover. Oh, Tapping I like with it. the body. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love playing, ta I forget what they're called, not taboo, but the charades games. Yes. It out. Yeah, like Pictionary yeah. or, um, yeah, those types of things. Yeah, maybe not Pictionary is not the right one. Yeah, I'm not, I, they're the kinds of games that I'm not very good at. I think I don't have enough air in my chart or something. Um, yeah, so interesting. Okay, so where can people find you, Litsen? What's your website? Where's your online home? Yeah, so people can find me online at, it's just litsen.space, which is L-I-Z-H-E-N dot space. Excellent. And you can subscribe there to stay up to date with astrology for social movements or just to, you know, connect with me around doing personal consultations. Yeah. Now um, this, and, and you're presenting at the Queer Astrology Conference this weekend. So people can either come along to that or they'll be able to get the recording, I guess, of your talk as well if they can't make it. Yeah, that's super affordable. Queer Astrology Conference has really tried to make this an extremely accessible conference that anyone can attend. And you don't have to be queer to go. You don't have to be an astrologer to go. You can just be an astrology fan. And a lot of the talks are geared for people to be able to follow along. Um, so it's the base rate is $49 for something like 25 talks. It's amazingly good value. Yeah. Amazingly it's amazingly good, good value. value. Yeah. And my understanding is that you can still sign up for it even after the conference is over. So if you can't decide yet, I think folks will have a chance to decide later. Excellent. Yeah. So do you have plans to come back or go back to California or are you like in Taiwan like permanently <laughs> or depending on COVID? Like what's the story there? You know what, Cass? I don't know what your Taurus planets are, but I feel you asking me all these like, you know, the practical questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do. My plan is to go back to Oakland, California. My partner is there. A lot of my life okay. is there. So yeah. 
Okay. But my family is all in Taiwan at this point. They all moved back. Fair from enough. Yes. Yeah. To Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm happy. I know what you're doing. Okay. I know the logistics. <laughs> <laughs> Your job here is done. <laughs> Practical job managed. Yeah. Excellent. Also lovely to uh, to have you on and uh, share this really uh, mind food talk that you're going to uh, provide. I think it's going to really get people's, you know, thinking caps on and really view history and astrology from a whole new perspective. Mm. So. Yeah, well, congratulations. Very happy for you to be you know, doing your first talk. Yeah, I'm humbled and honored so to be doing it. So exciting, yeah. Yeah, honored really and upwards. to have you. Yeah, yeah. start of even more, I, am, I can yeah. only imagine. Yeah. Well, thank you Excellent. all so much for having me. It's great to join you. I love listening to the Water Trio, so it's fun to be here. Thank you so thank much. You. We'll have a great conference and we'll see everyone next time. Take care. Bye, Bye for now.